Hello, so I've been a mathematician most of my life and I've thoroughly enjoyed it. And so now I want to try to give a little bit of advice, a little bit of advice to people who might want to become mathematicians. I suppose most of them will be quite young. Maybe teenagers who have aspirations one day of becoming a professor or conversely it could be some some old guy who has just retired a retired engineer say who would be very interested in starting up some mathematical research i'm not well i am going to focus a little bit on the younger demographic because they have a challenge in order to do mathematics in the modern world um unless you're rich enough you pretty much have to work and therefore one has to jump through all of the different hoops of the education system in order to get to a research position. So that's something I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about... I'm, I'm going to talk very little about how to actually do mathematics in a mechanical way today. I'm going to talk more about the sort of um, big decisions one has to make and the things that one sacrifices, the things that one gets out of it, and so forth. Okay then, so let's look at this from the eyes of a new undergrad student. They've just sit, sat down at their first maths class at 18. I'm going on the English system here, it's what I know. And suddenly some guy starts talking maths to them in front of a room, a professor. And maybe that kid thinks, hmm, that looks like quite a nice job. Maybe one day I would like to be a professor. If I try hard at this work, maybe I can do that one day. Well, that's true. However, the fact of the matter is that being an undergraduate or being a postgraduate is very, very different to being a researcher. Not that researchers are better, no, no, certainly not. But it is a matter of different skills. Let me try and explain. Imagine you're going to a freestyle dance event. You and your friends are going to a freestyle dance event. There's only a few positions left to do the dancing. And none of you have cars or bikes. The only way to get there is to run across a really long field. And so, as you're trying to get this to this dance event with all your friends or peers, um, your muscles start to hurt. It becomes tough. It becomes a physical challenge on your body. Who can be the fastest? Who can be the best at one specific thing? Running. And then, finally, when you arrive at this dance contest... Okay, your legs might be a bit weary or a bit stronger um, if you have a rest or whatever. But after that, the freestyle dance contest begins. And a whole range of new kinds of abilities are required to do well. One has to be able to think up creative dance music uh, routines, use different muscles like those of the arms um, and more of the back. And so, I'd say that this is a fairly good analogue for the life of a, someone who goes from an undergrad to a, to a postgrad. Because suddenly, like, I was never especially, you know, I had to try hard in exams. I have never been especially easy at passing them, except maybe uh, the a lot of the maths ones were uh, not so difficult. But... Um, in general, I had to work really hard to pass the exams. And some of my most difficult points along my career were certainly during my BSc year and MSc year when we had exams. Um, so I wasn't good at the kind of running analogue style thing. But I was good at the kind of... Um, freestyle dance kind of thing which corresponds more to research okay 
forget this rather uh, dodgy metaphor. Let's try and talk a bit more seriously. Basically, in order to pass exams, you've got to have lots of skills. And I'm going to run through a few of those quickly. Uh, but just before I do, um, I'd like to say that the main challenge, and I really mean this, the main challenge of, if you, want to, if you actually want to make it all the way to be a researcher, and a happy researcher, is to keep that inquisitive nature and keep that kind of inclination to study things that no one has studied before or say to pick up a system like a circle that you know everyone studied before but who cares it's a circle it's interesting right if you can keep that kind of attitude and that kind of pure curiosity towards things then you're almost guaranteed to do well in research because if you're working in that kind of way, then it's enjoyable and it, the momentum of it travel um, pushes itself round. Anyway, I'll talk more about that later. Let's get down to the nitty gritty. Obviously, there's no PhD if there's no exam. Sorry, if there's no exams passed, right? So, how do you pass exams? Well... There's the body stuff, um, so eat a lot of fruit, do a lot of running, don't have caffeine before bed, uh, do some swimming, uh, take plenty of time out, and so that's some of the body things. Another body thing which is a little controversial um, is the use of extra things. I mean, let's face it. We use caffeine to wake us up, right? It's a stimulant. Um, I know, like, so many uh, legal agencies are fond of saying no drugs, but it's easy to walk past them with a cup of coffee. Apparently there's some, there's some uh, confusion there. But anyway, um, there are other various legal things called nootropics, which are essentially learning drugs. Um, and so one particular one which is very safe and very well known and one of the most well used is paracetam. Paracetam was used originally in the 1960s as a attempted cure at Alzheimer's disease. It does a lot of, it, of these pills you swallow every day and they do a lot of work to I'm, I'm no neuroscientist, but to sort of repair the constructions of, of the uh, brain network. And I think in studies that have been shown that over two months, they um, led to about a 20% increase in the verbal reasoning of the subjects on average. Um, so there's things like that, which you might find helpful. Everyone's got their different take on these kind of things. But there's other kinds of um, body things. Another body thing which is quite useful for studying is um, to do with using different kinds of sweets. So it turns out that you eat, if you eat a specific sweet with a specific flavour when you study a specific subject, then say you eat licorice sweets every, every time you talk about calculus, every time you study calculus and no other time, then you will find if you pop a licorice in your mouth while you're doing your calculus exam, those sweets and smells will bring back lots of memories. Smell is one of the greatest kind of um, sort of um, conveyor of memories that there is. In fact, I think it's, and this sounds a bit silly again, but hey, I don't care. I mean, I just want to do what I want to do. If people think it's silly, then that's their problem, I guess. But I, I think it's a really good idea as well to bring sound into the game. Um, say you have to learn a particular passage. Well, why not make it into a song? 
or if you have to learn a specific um, thing about a, a physical process, I mean, why not make it into a song? I mean, for example, if a body is harshly or, po or partly immersed in a fluid, then it's a waste. It, it. Excuse me, let me start again. I'm improvising this song, you see. If a body is harsh, is. <laughs> okay, one more time. If a body is holy or tart or tart If a body is hoshal So here's one. This is just ad lib, so uh, and I can't sing anyway, but just for example, um if a body is wholly or partially immersed in a fluid then it experiences a weight equal to the weight of the of the material displaced. Okay, so there's a kind of um, musical version of Archimedes' uh, law of upthrust. Um, of course, that was a really shoddy song, and um, it's probably not going to help much. But I remember I had a solid state exam. I didn't go to almost any of the lectures. A very good friend gave me their notes, which I photocopied, and I had a few days to learn it. I remember I sat down at the piano and played a terrible song called Lone Electron, and all the lyrics were about how this electron would be going through this solid-state matter and interacting with things and emitting various particles and whatnot. And, yeah, it really brings a sense of life to the subject. That's... That's what studying ought to be about. Like, get as many different senses involved as you can. Um, there are also some much more well-known and reputable ways to improve your ability to remember things for exams. And those include, for example, uh, well, I would definitely point you in the direction of Tony Bazan. He's written a lot of books on sort of how one can improve one's brain and it's amazing like the differences it can make for example um well i often use mind maps for a vision and they are simply a fantastic tool in fact they're now available on mobile phones and very good for organizing too the idea there is that the mind works in a linear kind, sorry, reading works in a linear kind of way, whereas the mind works in a kind of networky way. So you make like a giant poster on your wall showing all your notes about, let's say, um, something like quantum mechanics or something, and then you'd have like Heidinger's uncertainty principle, uh, which might be linked to um, some of our ideas to do with waves and then you've got the Schrodinger occasion and you've got that linked to this idea of Schrodinger's cat and so forth and you just think about what the ideas are and how they're connected and look at this giant kind of map almost like a space of information that you have to learn or that you should learn for your exam so that's one thing another thing is that there are some extremely useful memory techniques out there i um when i was an undergrad i i didn't know many of them but i've recently found out about a few there's an absolutely fantastic one which i shall um i shall put a link to um where there's sort of 10 guys who go into a pub and one guy tells them how to do this method and these guys are able to give be given quickly given a list of 20 objects random objects like object number one a spoon object number two a teddy bear object number three a blanket and so forth and then later he asks them what's object number five what's object number seven and they pretty much nailed them uh, just by using his technique so and also there's other things with speed reading and all, all the rest of it. These are all well worth uh, looking into. 
especially at the beginning, um, to try and give yourself a bit of a boost as far as doing exams goes. Um, because that part's not easy. And in all honesty, um, just as if you were sort of um, having to go a real long way walking to get to some kind of dance event, it's not always fun. But it's worth pushing yourself through that to get to the point where you're the one who's actually creating the research. Um, that's a very, very worthy goal in my opinion. So then, that's a lot about how to pass exams and so forth. But the most important thing I have to stress to you is that if you are really interested in becoming a mathematician, you should be doing mathematics for fun. When you get a summer holiday, you should be thinking things like, okay, I'm going to have a look at the prime numbers today. I'm going to try and solve some unsolved problem today. I'm going to go out and, you know, count the leaves on the flowers and see if there's any patterns today. Whatever kind of mathematics you're interested in, or I'm going to try and solve this crazy integral today. Whatever type of math mathematics you're interested in, um, it ought to be something which is you something which is something which you enjoy i was about to say it all also should be original i mean um especially young people people who haven't been exposed to all of the different things that you're shown um in universities um have a propensity for so much more originality and you'll see this time and a time time and again in mathematics that someone can just come along with a completely different view of things and completely turn everything over. And this can happen uh, because of young people or because of people who have come from other subjects or different backgrounds. For example, there was an amazing theorem which was, which was found out by a completely blind uh, topologist mathematician about the Alexander Horn sphere. And um, Euler, one of the best mathemat mathematicians ever, um, discovered loads of his great results while he was blind. Um, also, I'd like to just... I'd like to just um, have a little go at trying to push back this idea which may, most people think is true which is that um, mathematicians or research scientists in general are more intelligent than regular people um, to my experience this is okay maybe they are slightly more intelligent on average but the thing that makes them good at the job is not having a superior IQ it's having the sort of personality which allows them to um, sort of focus very, very, very carefully on specific things. And maybe even other more sort of antisocial characteristics like to find quiet places where they can spend absolutely ages reading about their favourite subjects. I mean, in fact... Um, Mathematics can be a great kind of uh, refuge from the uh, from the kind of everyday goings on of the real world, and um, in that sense, I think there might be quite some uh, unintelligent people who, just as a matter of kind of being seclusive or being obsessive or whatever it is, have just happened to find themselves doing loads and loads and loads of math because that's what they dig and this can lead to some of the most immense breakthroughs ever so don't worry about whether you're intelligent enough to do maths obviously worry about whether you're getting good enough grades to go 
to wherever it is you want to do maths. And let's face it, in the modern world, um, the way things are changing, I think there's probably going to be more and more easier ways to be a maths researcher than to be paid by a university and to have to have a PhD. I mean, I, I don't know if uh, the education systems forgot this, but we do actually have an internet which can basically tell us pretty much everything at a click of a finger. I think, um, I don't know quite long how long the uh, education system is going to take to catch up with this fact, but there it is. But ultimately, I've saved this for last, that there's one particular thing which is going to get you more which is going to get you further in your academic career than anything else. And that is love for your subject. Or perhaps I'll gay it down a little. Maybe I'll say curiosity. But that's going to be the thing that really gets you through it. If you're curious enough about things, and if you know the sort of ways that you can actually try to satisfy that curiosity if you know the skills then you know you you can be a dynamo you can just be constantly going around from one problem to another um sort of solving them finding them interesting and carrying on now i'm not saying that one should be doing this all the time of course we're not all completely manic all the time and there's nothing wrong with having a while when you're not doing research. But the point, I think, is to start to identify a few particular problems or a few particular areas which you really dive in depth to. And I swear, in almost all good math subjects, the deeper you get, the more beautiful you see things are. Um... So, for example, I remember when I was about seventeen, I started looking at, um, I started looking at prime numbers, and you know I used to play with these prime numbers every evening, looking for patterns in them, trying to find formulas for them, etc. It was really easy math, as far as it was only you know arithmetic, and I did find a couple of sort of theorems and things, but I mean, basically that wasn't the point. The point was I got to experience that thrill of discovery. And that my young friends is what I think is most important for you. While you're, uh, while you're young or while you have time, start researching new things. I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's like um, how many different shaped pentagons there are or how many different knots there are up to a certain number of, of crossings. Or how many pizza boxes you can stack like this on a table before the pizzas fall off. Or what's the distribution of the primes. Or um, what's going on with all these mysterious things in group theory to do with the monster. Or dot, 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 dot. There's zillions of things one can study. And I would advise you not to get put off if you think a problem's already been solved. Just forget about it. Just look at it yourself. Um, it's very possible that you, if you look at it hard enough, you'll find aspects which were never discovered by the previous researchers. And I suggest you do this during your undergraduate course. I would recommend, this is a bit controversial, but I would recommend doing as little work as possible to, to get where you want to go in your course. Meanwhile, spend your leisure time 
enjoying your youth and fun, but also enjoying amazing math problems that are going to teach you and are going to make you into a wonderful researcher later on.